thinking about real estate. And, you know, when I was growing up, my, my parents would always rent out a room in our house. So you know, I would live in a five bedroom house and then they would rent out like the downstairs room to some tenant for some extra income. So I didn't really understand that, but I just kind of saw it. So, you know, after I worked for a while, I basically was like, well, I need to find my own house. <laughs> and I specifically targeted, um, if you're familiar, like the East Bay area. Um, and, and there, and why I chose the East Bay was because houses were under a million dollars. And at the time, That's it was right. just, yeah, it's just what's under a million dollars. And, you know, I grew up in San Jose and houses were over a million. And if you kind of look at the path of progress, it goes from San Jose, Pleasanton was a million dollars. Dublin was a million dollars. So I literally looked at the city next to Dublin, which was Livermore, which was under a million dollars. So I just said, hey, let me just look at, check out this area. They just built like a brand new outlet there. They're going to extend the, the BART station there. So <clears throat> I just started looking at homes there. And I think literally I went to like five open houses and I just made like three offers and my third offer got accepted. I mean, that, that's how easy it was back then. So I got the house for about $800,000 and my intent was just to kind of live there because it was kind of closer to my job. So it was a primary residence, you know, I down 10%. So, you know, 80K in and I basically own this asset. And, you know, it's still relatively pretty young. So I just ended up renting out three other rooms to, you know, kind of working professionals. Um, we, we were near a kind of a laboratory and it just attracted you know, a lot of post PhD um, students and they just wanted a place to stay. So I ended up renting out like three of my bedrooms for a thousand each, including utilities. So that's, that's 3K a month. And oh, wow. that basically just covered my, my mortgage. So my cost was about maybe 1500 between property tax, insurance, HOA. So that's how I kind of got started. I, I literally downed, I, I literally paid off all my student loans. I literally had no money. I downed on the house. And I remember when I wired the, the down payment, I had like $2,000 in my bank account. And literally the broker was a, a relative. So he kind of gave me a part of his commission to help cover some of my closing costs. So I was literally, I think I had like $2,000 in my bank account. And then, you know, I was waiting for this, like, was it $6,000 check to come for me from commission. And then I was like desperately trying to rent out the rooms. So that's kind of how I got started. And it, it kind of taught me quite a bit. I mean, it's interesting living with your, your, your tenants, <laughs> you know, especially being a bit younger. Um, but you know, for me, it was kind of a, a great learning experience. And, you know, obviously just like learning how to negotiate leases and dealing with tenant issues, you know, every time there's an issue of roommates, you know, I basically have to deal with it. And I was basically doing that on top of my, you know, my nine to five job. Um, at the time I was a, I just became a pharmacy director. So, um, I thought, well, I can manage like 14 people at work. I can probably manage like three at home. Like there's <laughs> literally like no difference. So that, that's what literally got me started. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half and then I, I actually got a job in San Francisco. So, uh, what I did was I couldn't commute from where I was the East Bay to San Francisco. It was like an hour and a half each way. Um, so from there I, I literally got a job and then I just started looking for houses again. And, you know, the, the job was in Daly city, which is like borderline between San Francisco and um, Burling game, if you guys are familiar, and it's just the same process. Like, like literally, um, my apparently I had an aunt that I know about that she lives in San Francisco. She's a realtor, and you know she just knew the area. So I just said, hey, let, let's just meet up and and on the weekend and just show me a couple houses. So literally, when I when I went to San Francisco to check out houses, it, it humbled me so much. Like as you guys know, San Francisco is very tenant friendly. So I, I remember seeing a house in the mission district and they literally had protected tenants in the house. And I didn't know what protected tenants were, um, but pretty much when you buy the house, the tenant comes with the house. So can, can you literally imagine buying a million dollar home? That's a five bedroom house and four of the bedrooms are already occupied with protected tenants. And then when you buy the house and you occupy it, you're going to live with these four tenants. So that, that just confused me like, like, crazy for, for lack of a better word. Like literally you're buying a house and you're buying roommates that come with it. Um, so 
that's what I kind of saw. And then like this house that literally, so we looked at like four or five houses and honestly, I was really, I guess, turned off by, by the houses, you know, the houses are a lot older in San Francisco, but we came across this one house and, and literally <laughs> the MLS pictures were so terrible. Like they literally took pictures in the dark, bad angles, poor lighting. So, but I just said, Hey, let's just go in. My, my aunt knew the area. So I went in the house and the house was beautiful. It was like nicely renovated, uh, new kitchen, new flooring, new carpet, new paint. It was really nice cosmetically. And I, I literally just walked in and then I walked out and made an offer. Like literally that's how fast I made an offer. And then they jumped in. They accepted my offer from the day. So that house, it was kind of interesting. Um, in San Francisco, um, Chang might know, like, it's kind of common to have, like, a, it's like a makeshift duplex. So we have an upper unit, which was three bedroom, two bath. And then the lower basement unit was literally two bedroom, one bath. But they, it wasn't a legal duplex, but it, the ba basement unit had its own entrance. So you kind of had privacy. So I kind of did the same process. Like, I literally lived in the master bedroom upstairs. I rented out the two bedrooms in um, the upstairs unit. Then I rented out the entire downstairs unit to, like, four um, college kids because I was near uh, SF State. So once again, you know, my um, for that property, you know, I got for 1.1 million back then in 2009. I down 10%. And I, I think I had a million dollar loan on it. But my monthly payment was probably around like maybe 7,000. And I was collecting probably about 5,500. So like once again, like it was you know, kind of house hacking, right? This is what they teach on the, the Bigger Pockets podcast. And for me, I didn't think about it. It was just more of like, I just had to move for my job. I never thought like, and then I just didn't want to sell my other property. Kind of my goal was, or every regret I've heard from people in the Bay Area is I wish I never sold my property. So I took that with me and just said, well, I can afford um, this down payment on the house. So that's how I kind of started off. And then, you know, most recently in 2022 during COVID, I, I relocated over to uh, a so SoCal where I'm currently based now. And it was the same process. Like literally I <laughs> got a job here and then, you know, in, in Orange County, it, it's expensive, but not Bay Area expensive. So it was the same model. Like well, what's under $800,000? That, that, that was literally my goal again. Um, so I was living like near Irvine, if you guys are familiar for a bit, but Irvine was expensive and then Mission Vale was expensive. But then there's a city called Lake Forest right next to Mission Vale, which was a little bit cheaper so i kind of took that same model that i did in the bay area and did that for um um in orange county and and this time i, I honestly got lazier like i just picked any like literally a uh, real real estate agent it didn't really matter to me because i, I kind of knew what i wanted and I, I would literally make offers on houses before i even saw them like if it just looked remotely you know eight, under eight hundred thousand dollars and looked decent i just made offers and then i would show up and then it sounds more serious when I'm like, I already made an offer on the property. I'm just here to look at it in person. So that's kind of like one little trick I, I've learned for that. And after about maybe three months, I, 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 I made about probably 30 offers in three months. And I finally got an offer accepted um, in Lake Forest. And it was the same situation as my San Francisco. Like literally the pictures are so terrible. Like um bad angles poor lighting like there's like two photos and i walked in there same thing like they literally spent about 200k to renovate that property so it was like brand new everything um so it was like the same process over again i just literally you know because i, I relook i just needed a house so i I bought, I bought a house near my job and i kept the prior two houses that i had so once i kind of did that i i just kind of thought like you know this is not really scalable to be honest i mean you know, it's like I'm paying 800 to a million dollars for a single family home. And, you know, honestly, at best, I was getting like maybe thirty five to 4000 in rent. And that's just enough to pay for your break even maybe, or maybe slightly negative, right? You know, California and, and New York, they're more appreciation markets, right? Like um, it, it, it's, you're going to lose money or break even if you're lucky. And I'm self-managing these properties even to this day, if I had a property manager, they take 10% off. So you lose even more. So, you know, after that, I just started thinking, you know, out of state, like, okay, like, 
how can I get more cash flow? I was focused on cash flow, right? California is all appreciation. New York is all appreciation. So literally, I went on like a bigger pockets podcast forum and I was just researching like markets that people are investing in. And, and a popular one where Claudia is investing is Jacksonville, Florida. That's very popular. And I just stumbled across um, Huntsville, Alabama. And the only reason why I came across that was because my cousin is in aerospace and he literally goes there like every quarter. And he just said that, yeah, like there's so many rocket scientists there, literally. It's literally the rocket scientist capital. They have the highest per capita of PhDs. So I just literally just started like researching about it. And then I posted on the Bigger Pockets forums. It's just, hey, like anyone know about the Huntsville market? And a realtor actually reached out to me um, saying that she basically had brand new builds, like new build construction. Like they weren't even built yet for around maybe 270K. And I can rent it out for 2100 And then, you know, if you guys know the 1% rule in real estate, it's like, it's almost 1%, right? So, you know, you're going to cash flow. So I kind of did the math and I'm like, I would cash flow about 700 bucks per, pro per property. And I just said, well, that's more than I'm making from my single family homes in, in California. You know, I'm probably breaking even or slightly negative. Uh, on my live on my property in Livermore, like, honestly, I'm, I'm, I was losing about 500 bucks a month on that property um for about three years but the property went from andrew k to 1.3 million in about five years so i mean i was losing 500 bucks per month but i mean the appreciation made up for it right i mean that's half a million in uh five years so after i kind of did my single family home out of state i actually joined a mentorship program um Actually, they, my, my, my mentor actually interviewed me for, for my first apartment deal, but I joined a mentorship program. Um, Peter Harris is his name. And, you know, believe it or not, it, it costs around 15 to 30 K to join the mentorship program. And initially I thought that was a little crazy. Like, I'll be honest, like, wow, 30 to 15 to 30 K for like this mentorship program. But, you know, I just said, Hey, let, let, let me try it out. Right. Worst case, um, I spent 30K and that's expensive MBA. That's what I call it. It's expensive real life MBA. Um, and I spent, you know, 250K on pharmacy school and getting a master's in public health. So I just figured, well, hey, like I spent on education before. So I literally joined his mentorship. You know, they teach you about, you know, apartment complexes, uh, mobile home parks and self-storage. That's what he specializes in as well as creative finance. And, you know, to be honest, like I, I went through his coursework it was about maybe 20, 10 to 20 modules. Um, and, and by the way, I'm not being paid uh, to, to advertise my coach at all. Um, but um, it's a bunch of modules. But like what I kind of liked about it was I was basically just following a system. Like you kind of had a system ready, like on how to market the deal, how to analyze the deal, and how to like follow up with your leads. So that's what I kind of really liked. I mean, honestly, like if you listen to a podcast, like what he taught me, it's already out there. But it was just kind of nice having that system that he followed. And then when you kind of spend fifteen to $30,000 on a course, you're kind of invested <laughs> to follow the system. Uh, when you get something for free, you don't really like, you don't feel obligated to take action. But if you invest it like fifteen to 30000 of course, you're going to like, like hold yourself <laughs> committed because you want to see a return on your investment. So, so literally, you know, kind of at a high level, if you guys don't know the difference between single family or one to four units versus five plus units the example i like to give is like let's just say you have two single family homes right next to each other one rents for five thousand and one rents for ten thousand when you go to sell they're worth exactly the same like it's based on the sales comparable but let's just say i have a 20 unit apartment complex that makes five thousand a month and another 20 unit that makes ten thousand a month uh based on the commercial lending the one that's ten thousand in rent that one's worth double the one that um it's getting 5,000 in rent. So once I kind of learned that concept, it, it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit because I always thought real estate was cash flow or appreciation, but literally with apartment complexes, the more cash flow you have, the more it forces the appreciation to go up. So after that, I, I just said it, it, it makes like zero sense for me to like do single family homes, like moving forward. Um, so what I did was I started just researching markets and you know, I, I own about two apartment complexes in Oklahoma City. 
in a mobile home park in Alabama currently. And people ask me why, like, why did I choose those markets? And I think literally I, I chose it because it was just, well, number one, they're landlord friendly, you know, California, New York, not, not the most uh, landlord friendly states are more tenant friendly. And number two, it was just cheap property or cheap um, property taxes. So just those kind of two factors. And number three is it just a more, you know, affordable housing, more workforce housing. And number four, most importantly, I kind of had uh, connections of property managers in those markets. So for me, because, you know, I'm not physically there, you know, I'm based in California. Um, so I just kind of, um, actually, my mentor gave me his property manager in Oklahoma City. And, you know, they, they basically kind of, I talked to them, they kind of showed me what's the good pockets, where are the bad pockets. So after that, I, I literally started a uh, direct mailing campaign. So what I did was I sent about 300 letters a month um, for about six months. So um, it, it, so I kind of did that. And when you kind of send out letters, typically you send out about 300 and you get about a 3% response rate. So if I send 300, I get about 10 people that call me. And then when people call you, it's literally, it's like, Three of them are like, hey, you're from California. You can overpay for my property, right? Like you're really rich. You're from California. Throw me like a pie in the sky offer and, and maybe I'll take it. So those type of, um, I guess, sellers, they're not motivated. They just kind of want, you know, maximum returns in their money. And then you have other kind of people who, you know, maybe like what's their situation, right? Maybe they just got a divorce and they need to liquidate their asset. Maybe they had a death in the family and the kids inherited the property and they, have, they want nothing to do with the property. Maybe it's, they had a bad property manager. The property manager was stealing from them. Maybe they didn't manage it very well and they just want to get rid of it. Maybe the seller wants to retire. I mean, there's many different reasons why, right? There's so many reasons why um, people want to, to sell and then, you know, out of those, those are kind of a little more serious, right? So like what I kind of learned was you're buying situations, you're not buying properties. Um, and once you kind of know that, it kind of makes it a little bit easier in terms of buying um, real estate. Um, so basically after about six months of sending out letters, um, this one guy, he called me, he was an attorney actually. So he owned a law practice in Oklahoma City and he was self-managing this like 26 unit by himself. He, he literally was a property manager. He did his own pest control. He did his own maintenance. He um, used one unit as his office for his law firm. So he, he was your typical mom and pop operator, right? Like I want to do everything myself. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that, that's what my parents were kind of telling me to do, but it's not scalable, um, as I said. So literally, um, you know, he called me or he shot me an email he actually didn't want to talk to me over the phone at all because he's a lawyer. He wanted everything written and documented. And he literally just like said, hey, I'm looking to sell uh, my, my 26 unit. Like, give me an offer. And then half the time, you know, you're kind of like, they throw the ball back in your court, right? It's negotiations. They want you to make an offer. So I just said, well, you know, if in order for me to make an offer, I need some information. So you always need, number one, the rent roll. And number two, you need a, it's called a, a T12, which is, essentially a profit and loss statement for the past 12 months. So those are the two documents you'll need um, to analyze the deal and to give to the lenders. And, you know, but a lot of these mom and pop operators, they don't have that stuff. You know, they literally <laughs> write things on a piece of paper or they take cash and they don't have good records, you know, because maybe they're lying on their tax records or whatnot. So... You know, after some back and forth, luckily he had some good, you know, numbers that he gave me. Like he pulled it off. He didn't give me his tax return, but he kind of pulled the numbers off his tax return. But as you guys may or may not know, you can kind of make up those numbers, right? Like, to be honest, there's no way to prove it. In, in commercial real estate, um, there's no, like, if someone's li lies to you in commercial real estate, you can't go after them and see them. But in like single family residential, they have like protection in place. So like if someone lied to you about something in a single family home, you can kind of go back after them. Uh, in the contract but commercial they deem that you're a more sophisticated investor so you should know your due diligence and be more intelligent in making your decisions um so so yeah so once you kind of go through all that i you know went through the property it was actually pretty good i analyzed the deal the units 
you know, the, the rents are about $300 under market. Like he was renting out, out for about 400 to 450 a month per unit, um, including electricity and utilities. And that just blew my mind because my rent in, Cal- in California is about 2,500. And I know in the Bay Area or San Francisco, it's like $4,000. Um, literally, that's, you can rent 10 units out in Oklahoma City for $4,000. Um, but, you know, I was analyzing the market rents and the market was around seven, $700. So I kind of knew that like, wow, I can bump the rents up by 300 bucks um, with some renovations. So you guys may have heard about the burst strategy, but basically I was kind of doing the burst strategy on my 26 unit on a larger scale. Um, so basically I bought the units. Um, I renovated probably, I'm going to renovate about half the units. It's going to cost me about $8,000 per unit to renovate. And what 8,000 gives me is basically a brand new kitchen, a uh, brand new paint, uh, luxury vinyl plank flooring, you know, ripping out the bathtub and putting in uh, a bath kit and, you know, getting a new bathroom vanity. So pretty much your, your, your typical cookie cutter, you know, apartment complex renovation. And then by putting $8,000, I can bump up the rent by 300 bucks. So if you kind of do the math of how apartments are valued, if you raise the rents by $300, you times that by 26, because uh, there's 26 units, you times that by 12, 12 months in a year, and then you divide that by the cap rate. So in Oklahoma City, it's it's a uh, um, an a cap. So I can't do the math off the top of my head, but if you kind of add that all up, I think it kind of increases the value by by at least about I think about six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars in value add. So so can you imagine putting in eight thousand dollars per unit, renovating twenty six units, raising the rent by three hundred dollars. And then after you stabilize the apartment complex, you do a cash out refi, pull out all your initial down payment and then all the renovation funds plus like a little extra. So that's just kind of like the burst strategy on steroids is what I call it uh, with apartment complexes. So once I kind of learned that strategy, I was just like, you know, this is like, it was insane to me. Like essentially one apartment complex can like change. It's like one apartment complex that stabilized is good enough to kind of retire you from like your W2. Like if you make six figures, um, if you give yourself enough time for that. So, so yeah, that's just kind of some background on that. And, you know, the funny part was for that 26 unit, I, I literally, so they told me to offer and I literally just went on the tax assessor's website. It's public information, right? You just can Google the address and type county at the end. And then you just search, <laughs> click tax assessor, and then you type in the address and it'll tell you the tax assessor price. And it was, I think, 520K for a 26 unit in Oklahoma city. And and literally if you're in California or New York, that's a condo, it's not even a condo. Um, I can probably get like a shack under a bridge in San Francisco for like half a million. Um, So I just made that offer and I was expecting them to say, well, what made you come up with that price? And then I would just say, well, that's what the tax record says. It's public information, right? (laughs) I was expecting them to say no, but he ended up saying yes. I, I think he was, like I said, he was really motivated and wanted to retire. And, um, you know, that, that was the case. So once I took over the property, I actually got it appraised. The bank appraised that 750 K. So I literally made about 250 K in equity day one. So when people kind of knock on me about kind of signing for that mentorship, you know, thanks to that mentorship, it got me to take action. It got me to take, follow a system and it kind of held me accountable because I knew that I paid, you know, f- about $30,000 to join this mentorship program and just just doing that <laughs> made me follow the system to a T. I didn't deviate whatsoever and ended up landing me my first 26 unit and made me about 250k equity day one. And what's kind of crazy is I started renovating the property and I, I literally just got cold called and a guy wanted to offer me $1.3 million. And I just started renovating about like one unit and I replaced the roof. So, I mean, I bought it for half a million. I got offered 1.3. So that's $800,000 in like profit, like literally in less than a year. So even if you want to flip the apartment complex, you can make that much money um, that rapidly. But I'm pretty steadfast on buy and hold. I mean, that's why I think the apartment's going to be valued at once I'm done renovating it. But then just do a cash out refi, pull out my money plus some, and then go buy another one. So that's kind of that. And then... <laughs> Not too long after I, I bought my 26 unit, I was literally looking on LoopNet and 
kind of my impression of loop so loopnet has all the commercial it's like the zillow of a commercial real estate you know or like the redfin of commercial real estate and my impression of loopnet was literally there's no good deals on loopnet like every deal there they're they've been passed through multiple people no one wants the deal they're either overpriced the owner isn't motivated or literally um there's something wrong with it that, that was literally my impression and i just was like looking through alabama and oklahoma because those are the two markets i'm investing in i literally came across this like mobile home park for like 1.1 million and it was a 200 lot mobile home park so i kind of once again got me thinking i'm like 1.1 million dollars 200 lot mobile home park that's how much my san francisco house costs single family home costs <laughs> So that kind of got me interested. I opened the ad and then it literally said in the comment, like 100K down, seller financing, 1 million. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, like seller financing is nice, right? You don't have to involve a bank. You, you, you know, banks make it very difficult to close on deals and, um, you know, less due diligence and all that. So I just said, all right, that sounds interesting. So I actually called that the broker, and it turns out that the broker, he, he manages about 70 parks currently, mobile home parks. And um, the owner that has it, you know, it, it's a huge distressed property and the owners that had it, they just weren't sophisticated enough to implement the, the value add strategy. So so basically it's 200 lots, there are about 35 um, occupied homes. So there's about 170 vacant lots and out of the 35, maybe half were paying. So, so literally half the tenants were, were paying rent. And they had about maybe 50 homes that either need to be torn down or renovated. So um, it's a huge, huge uh, project. Um, I'll, I'll probably kind of talk more about it in a later, you know, meet up if people are interested in mobile homes, but like kind of at a high level, you know, I'm, I'm probably putting in, about, it probably needs about $600,000 uh, worth of CapEx. Um, if the park is full, it's going to be worth around maybe seven, eight million. Um, but it's going to take about six to seven years to get there. And I kind of did analysis, like my worst case scenario on this deal is let's just say if I were to put in 600,000 in CapEx and I were to sell it, I'd probably lose about 300 K. That's my worst case scenario. But my best case scenario is, as I said, it could be worth about six to 7 million. And in that case, you know, you would have made about six to $7 million, um, in equity over like what is it? Five, six years. So it's about a million dollars a year in terms of equity. Um, so I thought the risk was worth taking <laughs> on that. And then most recently in, um, I think May of this year, I closed on a 20 unit in Oklahoma. It, it was funny. I sent about 1800 letters about the same time I got my 26 unit. It was the same letter batch of 1800. I sent that out and this guy, he literally mailed back me a postcard <laughs> in response to my letter. And he just said, Hey, I'm interested in selling. Um, just give me a call. And then he literally wrote his number and I called him and he was a, I think a loan officer in New York, I believe I think he lives in New Jersey, but he, he, he worked in New York and you know, he owned this small 20 unit in uh, Enid, Oklahoma, which is a more kind of like a rural town. It's 50 K population. And he just called and just said, Hey, like I have this 20 unit, you know, I just want to get rid of it and allocate the money towards another business that I own. So I just started and he just said, I just want the tax assessed price. So kind of learning what I did from the 26 unit. I know if you offer a tax assessed price, typically it's undervalued, right? It, what it's going to appraise for is going to be higher. So I kind of knew, okay, well, he wants tax assessed price. If I offer on it, I'm going to make money equity day one. Um, so that's what exactly what I did. I basically um, offered him the, the tax price of about 415,000, 20 unit. Um, once again, it's dirt cheap <laughs> compared to California. Um, but for this deal, uh, traditional lenders actually wouldn't want to lend on it. I guess they didn't like the cash flow. Um, the property had a burned out unit. So the, I think the owner was so cheap that I think literally one unit was burned down and he didn't want to spend the money to like renovate it, fix it up. And he didn't have good enough insurance because if you buy good insurance, if the unit burns down, usually the insurance will kick in and you'll get a brand new unit unless you bought cheap insurance. If you bought cheap insurance, then you're just going to leave it burned down. Um, so 
you know, it's good and bad. I mean, good in the sense of like, there's deferred maintenance. So, you know, obviously you can implement the value add strategy, but it's bad in the sense of like, well, if he's not doing that, what else is he not taking care of? Um, so basically I got a property inspection on that. Um, you know, did pretty well. He had a brand new roof installed about three, three years ago. So I thought that was sufficient enough. And, um, just went, there's no other major red flags. You know, I was able to find a hard money lender, um, that was willing to basically lend me on the home purchase plus about a hundred thousand dollars worth of renovation. And it's interest only at 9%. At the time I thought 9% was quite a bit, but interest rates now are for single family homes are like close to 6%. So I just said, well, you know, I'm renovating this apartment complex and half the units are occupied. So even while I'm renovating, I'm still collecting money every month, right? Versus if you're renovating a single family home, like you're getting $0 and you're paying interest until you're done with renovations and until um, it's complete and rented out. So that's what I kind of like about apartments as well is like, you know, if, ten are, if you're not getting money from 10 units, but the other 10 units are paying for you, like you're still kind of collecting um, cash flow day one. So, you know, my mortgage is about maybe 1300 and I'm collecting about 4,000 and only half the units are occupied. So I kind of view it as a break even, right? Between all the insurance, the um, pro property tax, property management, all the utilities, everything, I'm probably breaking even. With half the units occupied, I'm renovating the other half. So kind of sorry for rambling, but that's kind of been my, my journey. I, I scaled quite significantly in the past you know, since 20, essentially middle of 2020, so about a year now, um, I've kind of pumped the brakes a little bit. Um, I've scaled a little too fast, you know, like once you kind of buy one deal, it kind of snowballs. Like once people know that, like you, cl you close on apartment complexes, literally like brokers are just cold calling me saying, Hey, we saw that you close on this apartment complex. Like we're selling one that's like three miles away from yours. Like, do you want to like make an offer? And once you kind of have that track record of closing and having that credibility, it just gets easier and easier and it kind of compounds. Um, so it, it, it just was kind of very, very humbling um, for myself. So, yep. Yeah, so, sorry for kind of that rambling.